Welcome to all of you tonight. I think it's absolutely thrilling that so many of you decided that this is an issue worth discussing because one of the issues that has most concerned the people who have been publicising the Snowden revelations in Britain is how little public outcry there seems to have been on this side of the Atlantic as opposed to in America. In America, then, the revelations that Snowden has given us about the intelligence agency's ability to snoop on millions of individuals' private data, not only know who we're talking to and who we're emailing, but what we're saying and when we're saying it, um, has caused not only a huge media reaction in America, but Senate hearings, possibly a change in the law coming up, and even conservatives like McCain denouncing what's going on because Congress hadn't authorised it. And yet here we've had William Hague simply assuring us that really there's no need to worry, it's all splendid, and um, those jolly good chaps know what they're doing. Well, tonight we're going to have one of those jolly good chaps assuring us that indeed it's all been fine for a very long time. I'll just, uh, am I allowed to say, David, that just before we came on, David said, well, of course, we've known about this for ages. And I said, since when? And he said, since 1967. Which when I wondered whether that was internet snooping, he tells me that was when it was first discovered that it was possible to snoop on telephone calls and the cables underneath the Atlantic. So he draws the conclusion from this that we should all have realized always that nothing that we did was private. Well, we're going to discover in the course of this debate how many of you believe that we should calm down, dears, because state snooping is a price worth paying for our security. I just want to remind you that you've already voted. You will all have on your seat one of these cards. And when you've heard all the speakers and you've heard the questions and answers, then while the speakers are doing their summing up, a box will go around and you'll be asked to put, if you believe that a state snooping is a white price worth paying, you tear your card in half and put the for section into the box. If you're still opposed to state snooping, you put the against section in. And if you're still undecided, please post the whole card. I hope I'll explain that again later, just in case anyone's confused. Um, so we start, first of all, with um, a, a very knowledgeable panel here. And our first speaker is the former director of GCHQ from 1996 to 1997. He was the first security and intelligence coordinator for the UK. He's responsible to the Prime Minister for the National Counter-Terrorism Strategy and Homeland Security from 2002 to 2005. And he's now an academic, a visiting professor in the War Studies Department of King's College London, and he's the author of Securing the State. Please welcome David Omond. Thank you, Madam Chairman, for that uh, uh, generous introduction for me and your neutral introduction to the subject. <laughs> Am I the only person here tonight to think that the motion we are debating is just a wee bit slanted? <laughs> Calm down, dears. Is the assumption that those on our side of the argument of the toffs from the establishment who are going to say, never mind, don't bother your little heads. Well, in a moment, I want to explain exactly what internet interception is about and why it's necessary. State snooping. What could be more pejorative as a term? I want to explain to you in a moment that what I mean by that and what my old colleagues down at GCHQ mean by that is uncovering terrorist networks, uncovering narcotics trafficking gangs, catching kidnappers and releasing victims, and uncovering the paedophile rings that, alas, span the planet. That's what state snooping brings you. Indeed, I could put the proposition the other way round, and I could say, is there anyone brave enough in the audience to stand up and say we should go out of our way to prevent our police service and our intelligence services from uncovering terrorist networks, from stopping terrorist attacks, from dealing with serious, serious criminality? I don't think there will be many in the audience who would say that. Because the problem with the internet and the way it has developed 
is that it requires techniques like PRISM and the buffering software that Mr. Snowden has described that GCHQ has developed called Tempera in order to find material on the internet. What we have is, it's called in the trade, packet switch networks. When you make a Skype call, when you send an email, when you do a transaction on social media, your transaction is broken down into little pieces, fired off by computers towards the destination that you put on your email or your message. But the path that that packet takes depends entirely on the economics of the global system. And if it's nighttime, a transaction between one of those terrorists in Kenya and their organizers in Somalia could actually go, or well, perhaps it'll go via Johannesburg, perhaps it'll go via Japan, it could go via San Francisco. It's wherever at that particular moment in time it's cheapest to send it. And the computers do this automatically. So finding the information that the intelligence services and the police are warranted to find on the people who are really dangerous to us requires that sort of capability. And I dug out a quotation um, from uh, the pillar of human rights, Duncan Campbell, the first journalist many years ago to expose what GCHQ did, and he told Parliament recently, it is fit and proper and necessary that interception of communications and processing of communications data be available as part of the armory. If we want a civilized society, if we want to deal with this evils, you have to have the capability. So the question is not about the existence of these things, it's about how they're controlled, uh, how the people involved are managed, and how the whole thing is overseen. The director of policy for Liberty recently said, and I quote, we suspect GCHQ, that's my old department, of intercepting billions of private emails and messages belonging to the UK population without parliamentary knowledge or approval. Wrong, wrong, wrong. They are not intercepting billions of emails. Indeed, what would one do with billions of emails? They are looking for the needles in the haystack, the communications, and this is done by the IP address, so you know that a terrorist is associated, perhaps one of the Kenya terrorists uh, will have had a mobile phone, they will have been in contact with someone in Somalia. You have the IP address of the mobile device that was being used, and you want to know who else were they in contact with. Can we work back and manage to locate and uncover the people behind that atrocity? That's what it's about. And when we look at the uh, volumes involved, 200 million emails a minute. How are you going to find the one email sent by that device? The answer is you're going to need some very clever people, some clever technology, and something like Prism and Tempera. So it's the needle they're after, not the haystack. Your communications and my communications and all our personal stuff is in the haystack. They're not interested in the haystack. They're interested in the needle. And what's more, legally, they're not allowed to look at the haystack. Because if you look at, again, I quoted that from Liberty, and the Liberty quotation um, said, without parliamentary knowledge or approval. Parliament passed a law. Everything that GCHQ is doing and has done is within the law. And we have that on the record from a Minister of the Crown, from the Foreign Secretary to Parliament. Is he lying to Parliament? No. 
We have it from the Parliamentary Intelligence and Security Oversight Committee, chaired by Sir Malcolm Rifkin. Is he lying? No. They are operating within the law, doing the job that we, as society, gave them to do to protect us. Could all this be misused if you didn't have the right oversight system, if you didn't have the right leaders of the intelligence community, if you didn't have the ethos which exists in places like GCHQ, which is a law-abiding ethos with a very high compliance. I remember when I was director, the senior judge who oversees the intelligence community uh, and the interception would descend on the organization with a team. And he had the right to go anywhere, pick cases at random, not just talk to the senior management, but he would go and cross-examine the young analyst. And the young analyst would have to justify that what they had asked for out of this machine was lawful. Was it proportionate in relation to the task they were trying to do, the seriousness of the crime they were trying to uncover? And was it necessary? And those tests are strict tests. And I have every confidence that, indeed, down there, that is the way they are behaving. So what all this... How am I doing? You've got another two minutes. Two minutes, right. Let me try and pull the threads together. We want to live in a civilized society. We are threatened. We are threatened by criminals. We are threatened by, nowadays, cyber hacking and so on uh, will be ever more prevalent. We are threatened by terrorists here and overseas. To reduce the risk, not to eliminate it, because there are no promises, and the Internet cannot possibly be monitored in total. But to reduce the risk, you can empower, on your behalf, uh, civil servants working down in Cheltenham, in GCHQ, to use tools like PRISM to find the communications of the people who want to harm you and me. I think that's a noble mission. What they are not doing is using these tools to intercept all our communications. So when you hear people, and maybe we'll hear a little bit in a moment, about monitoring all our communications. Forget it. What is happening is that the computers are going through the internet looking for the address of the terrorist computer. To do that, they have to look through the material. But they're computers. They're not conscious. They're not reading your emails. With that reassurance, I hope I can invite you <coughs> I wish I didn't have to say, please vote for state snooping. <laughs> I hope I have convinced you that what you're actually voting for is a decent society. Thank you very much, David, for a very convincing opening speech. Now, our first speaker against the motion is Kenneth Kukier, who is the data editor of The Economist. He's also written a book on the subject, Big Data, A Revolution That Will Transform How We Live, Work and Think, which is a New York Times bestseller that's been translated into 16 languages, and he's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. Kenneth, would you like to take your stand at the podium? Thank you very much, and good evening. Chair Russell, Sir David Omond, Philip Mudd, John, ladies and gentlemen, dears. <laughs> I was informed prior to coming out here that everything that happens tonight is being recorded, uh, and it's also being videotaped by Intelligence Squared. Unfortunately, I didn't hear that from Jenny, but from David. <laughs> In fact, seeing that we have two former Intelligence operatives here gives a whole new meaning to intelligence squared. But I only wish we were here to talk about a more pleasant topic. Instead, we must turn our minds to dark 
subjects. We need to have an honest conversation and we need to talk about impolite things in polite company. This is not a debate over whether surveillance is an important and effective tool for security. Obviously, it is. It would be hard for anyone of reasonableness to claim otherwise. That's not what is at stake. Like all tools, it begs questions. Is the surveillance suitably proportionate to the threats? Is it effective? Is it sufficiently accountable to our political representatives and to the public? The question is whether this is a useful tool isn't really much of a question. Obviously, it's useful. We have security because of it. My own country in the United States helped win the Cold War because we could intercept the communications of drunk Soviet leaders and know where they were moving missiles at different moments in time. And thankfully, through doing that, we have found a way to have not used nuclear weapons for over 60 years remarkably. Of course, surveillance is an incredibly important function for all the reasons that Sir David has outlined. But like a chainsaw, like a tool, like a power tool, it can help us, but we have to be careful or we'll cut off our hands. Like nuclear energy, it can help our cities, but it can also leach toxins that can kill us. So it requires careful handling. Now, the problem with Sir David and Philip Mudd's defense of the motion is that it is without limits, it is without bounds, and it is out with, without restraints. So the case in favor of mass surveillance is actually relatively easy to make. After all, it's the status quo. All you have to do is close your eyes, lie back, think of England. The case against surveillance is actually harder to make. We are here tonight because of the recent disclosures of Edward Snowden of America's National Security Agency. So let us consider what we now know today that we didn't know just a few months ago. America collects all the records of all the cell phone subscribers in the United States and stores it for five years, which comes to billions of data points every month. Every single postal envelope in the United States is recorded. The data on the sender and the recipient is extracted and stored. A program called PRISM sucks down the data from major web firms like Google, Skype, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, collecting data from around the world. You, you, John, you, you, you too, John. Yes, this happens under, under court orders, but it's a secret court, so we don't really have much of an idea of what's going on. Actually, we now have a little bit of an idea. We know that in the past 25 years, since the Foreign Intelligence Service Act court has been in operation, they have approved 19,000 requests. They have denied four. Okay. In Britain, a program called Tempora is run by the GCHQ, which David alluded, in cooperation with the NSA. In fact, the NSA finances it a little bit. All of you, through your tax revenue income, does as well. So it taps all of, almost all of the international calls and email and web traffic that goes in between Europe and the rest of the world through the United Kingdom. This is stored and can be called up. There's about 200 fiber optic cables that are tapped, and in terms of how many emails that are collected, I will agree with David that they do not collect billions of emails a day. According to the leaked documents, the number would be 600 million emails per day. Okay, so wrong, 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 maybe. The haystack versus the needle, it is true that what you care about is the needle. But think about it. Sir, that is surveillance from the days of alligator clips on twisted copper pair wires. The way that surveillance works today, as I'm sure you know, is that we don't care so much about drilling down on who the individual is, on that one suspect. 
Who a person is isn't what they say and what they do. It is the penumbra of data and connections with them and their circle around them. It doesn't look like the telephone system and the black rotary dial. It looks like Facebook and LinkedIn. It's about connectedness. So actually, it's not about the needle that we care about. We want the haystack, and the great difference is that 10 years ago we couldn't analyze the haystack, and today we can, so we collect all the hay. So, when a gentleman of honor and responsibility says that we do not intercept all of the email, we have to question what does it mean by the term interception? Is it means that we collect and store to scrutinize a single thing? Maybe that's true that it's just one, but if it's collecting so much, in fact, from what we know because of Edward Snowden's disclosures, they do go for the whole haystack. That is the very language of General Keith Alexander, the head of the National Security Agency. Okay. So taken together, what this means is that we have laid the infrastructure for the surveillance state, and we can only be thankful that we have responsible and honorable people like Sir David and like Philip Mudd and their successors overseeing this powerful tool to protect us. But that is not good enough, because just depending on the goodwill of a handful of people is not sufficient. People retire from public service, as Sir David and Philip Mudd have. So we need institutional controls. We need to ensure that this great power to spy on one's own citizens is subject to oversight and to restraint. So how have our intelligence agencies in Britain and America carried out their responsibilities? Ladies and gentlemen, I can report that they have let us down. We gave them immense power and very modest oversight, and even then they exceeded their authority in what they collect and how they use it. Let me give you two quick examples. They're actually funny ones. So a few years ago, NSA agents were setting up a trawl of phone conversations, but they confused the area code for Washington 202 with the international dialing code of Egypt, 20. And so all of, these, all of these telephone calls from Washington, D.C. started flooding them, not from Egypt. And it's kind of cute, because you can imagine it's a human error, and these things just sort of happen. But the NSA agents actually hid that from their internal inspectors. <clears throat> we know that because of Edward Snowden. Okay. So now we know that a few, over the past few years, NSA agents have gone into their massive databases of the activities of everyone around the world, and they used it to examine their love interests. That's really cute. You know, there's something in signals intelligence is what we call it in the trade for signals. Well, this is called love int in the trade. It's so common, they even have a little term for it. And that's kind of cute, too. But, um, and it turns out that it wasn't just going on a first date. It was an ex-girlfriend, a divorced spouse, to be sure, those abuses, though some people were disciplined and some people were terminated. But wait, none were prosecuted? Okay. What, we, what is the use of having these legal protections if we can't prevent the abuse of power because the rules are not upheld? So to say, calm down, dears, I agree with David, is patronizing and wrong. But where we disagree is that apparently we have been too calm until now. What this means is that, one, the scale of spying is far more than we ever imagined. Two, the processes of outside uh, scrutiny and the rule of law are no longer there. This is unacceptable. So let me conclude. It is in the nature of our surveillance authorities to expand their powers, to reach for evermore, and we even set up incentives for that. It is our fault as citizens when overstepping that bounds happens, and it is our responsibility to prevent it and curtail it when it exceeds the limits that we all agree we have set in place. So before we criticize our spies, we may want to criticize ourselves. But the thing about state spying is this. You only know it's been too much when it's already become too much. And by that time, it's too late to do anything about it. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth, for that powerful rejoinder to David's powerful argument. Now we're joined via video link by 
the former CIA counterterrorism analyst and FBI senior intelligence advisor until 2010. Philip Mudd currently sits on the advisory board of the National Counterterrorist Center, and he's going to speak second for the motion. Philip, I hope you're there. Yes, thank you for having me. Looming over us like Big Brother. <laughs> That's right. I'm uh, snooping on you as we speak. <laughs> you know, we're, we're witnessing great changes in society. We're witnessing greater urbanization. The incidence of crime in our cities is high. Street violence is high that threatens families in London, families in New York, families in Washington. There are questions about the investi investigative capability of our security services, our law enforcement services to handle these major societal changes. And the people who spark public debate, those who set our laws, are looking at how to manage this evolution of society how to change our law enforcement services, and they're facing a headwind of people who say, this raises questions about potential abuse, about the infringement of citizens' rights, and this is the 1820s in Great Britain when Sir Robert Peel said there has to be a better way. We have to establish something that became the Metropolitan Police. This was not simply as a result of a few incidents of violent crime, it was a result of major changes in culture and society. If we fast forward 190 years, we're not talking about Snowden and we're not talking about terrorism. We're talking about everything I witnessed at the FBI and the CIA, organized crime, child pornography, human traffickers, drug traffickers, terrorists who are increasingly globalized and who communicate by different methods. That is the internet, that is Skype. So we see changes, as we did 190 years ago, in the way crime works. We see changes in our ability to understand that crime, in our ability to map a conspiracy. Those changes result from the digital trail, the digital exhaust that every single one of us leaves. That is, when we get on the internet, when we get on Skype, when we go to an ATM, when we buy a plane ticket, every single one of these leaves a bit and a bite. And it allows a law enforcement or intelligence professional, if you're involved in a conspiracy or a potential conspiracy, to very quickly understand without committing the kinds of massive resources it would take by putting men and women on the street to understand the extent of that conspiracy in a digital world. The way the Met might be able to understand a conspiracy in the 1930s that couldn't have been understood that quickly 20 years earlier. There is a third cultural thing beyond the way crime networks operate beyond the digital trail we leave that I think is critical in this debate, and that is what people expect whether they know it or not. When I've testified countlessly in the United States on the Somali problem that we faced here with kids leaving to go to, to Mogadishu, the first American suicide bomber was a Somali expatriate kid from the United States. When I testified after 911, the questions that never were raised never, were how did you investigate the crime that happened? The questions were, why didn't you prevent these crimes from happening? Whether we want to acknowledge it or not, whether we want to look in the mirror or not, the expectations, at least on this side of the pond, stated or not, are that law enforcement provides security for people before things happen and not just after things happen. And I felt like we were responsible to the people speaking through the executive branch and the, and the legislative branch United States to try to prevent bad things from happening by quickly mapping networks in a digital world. The world changed. It wasn't Snowden. It wasn't terrorism. It was the evolution of culture and society that forced us to stay behind or stay with it. Let me tell you what that felt like. Every morning and every evening for 10 years looking at the threat matrix of threats flowing in from Europe, the Middle East, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and North America. There was first a question of speed. If you collect a phone number from a Kenyan mall tonight that has a linkage to the United States, I want to know immediately within 24 hours what numbers that number called in the last three years. I want to know who it called, and I want to be able to map that digitally without going to a bunch of internet service providers, a bunch of phone companies that might have different legal standards for how they comply, different standards for how long they maintain this data. I want to be able to aggregate this information very quickly 
from disparate sources, different kinds of data, structured and unstructured. I want to be able to do this with a speed that will allow me to map the network within 24 hours so that there, there is something afoot, whether it's fundraising or a follow-on conspiracy in the United States or Europe, that I get to it before it gets to me. And I want to be able to turn on a dime. That cell might be terrorism today. It might be child pornography tomorrow. It might be human trafficking on Saturday. This is not a question of how we collect data. It's not a question of state snooping. It's a question of whether investigative resources and capabilities in the 21st century maintain the standards, the ways of work that we established in the 20th century, or whether, like with Sir Robert Peel's establishment of Metropolitan Police, in a revolutionary way to police in the, 19, in, the, in the 1820s, in the midst of great opposition, we evolve. Human beings don't like change. Every one of us says that we can deal with uncertainty and fear. Every one of us would raise our hands and say, we're ready for the 21st century, and we embrace change at the office, at home. My experience in huge bureaucracies and dealing with the American people is that we speak about embracing change, but it makes us, and I think appropriately, nervous and uncomfortable, as it did with parliamentarians 190 years ago. But whether or not we like change, we've established parameters for people like me to operate with speed against an adversary that's global, an adversary that does not have to get on the ground to create a transaction to raise money, sending pornographic images of infants from Romania to the United States, is something we've got to map overnight with tools that we did not have 15 years ago. And we've got to figure out how to use those tools. One more comment before I close. This is not about state snooping. This is not about reading emails. This is about, and this is a subtle difference, whether we collect the data to understand a network so that when that network emerges, we can snoop on those people. There's a fundamental difference here between the collection of information and how we analyze it. And we ought to make that distinction in this conversation. We are not here tonight to decide the question of how to deal with data in some ways. Previous lessons have taught us we have to evolve. We're not even here to assess, in my judgment, whether the government can collect data. I think we're here to assess how the government lives within parameters we set, and we shouldn't decide those parameters based on mistakes. Mistakes will happen whether it's with the Met or whether it's NSA or GCHQ in the future. It's how we must deal with a world that's evolved substantially. That world is not going to change with this debate tonight. That world already made these decisions for us. Thank you. Difficult to hear. Yes. Nothing much I can do about that. Thank you, Philip. That was very eloquent. I hope everybody in the audience could hear it. Um, just because the um, microphone, when broadcast across the room, wasn't quite as clear as it might have been. But perhaps when we come to your summing up or when you're answering questions, you could go a little slowly just sure. to take account of that. Thank you very much. Our, f our fourth speaker and our second speaker against the motion is the advisor to Google on freedom of expression and culture, so he's in exactly the right seat at this moment. Um, he's the former chief executive of Index on Censorship, and he's the author, broadcaster, and commentator, John Kampfner. Thank you very much indeed, Jenny. And first of all, I'd just like to pay tribute to all our speakers um, until now, to David, to Philip, our adversaries, and to Ken for excellent contributions um, so far. Um, David, you and I have more than one thing in common. We Brits, we don't wear ties. You compare it to, to the more buttoned-up Americans. We also have... You can always trust a man in a tie, I find. I, we're just trying to be like sort of early version of David Cameron. Um, <laughs> um, but we have another thing in common. Um, we both think the motion is... 
<laughs> you, don't, you probably don't like this. Sorry, my microphone's coming off. Um, uh, we both think that the motion is, um, is slanted. Um, we think the motion is slanted um, the other way. Not the, um, the calm down deers bit, but the state snooping is a price worth paying. Everybody um, with any ounce of sense would understand the important work that intelligence services do around the world. Um, the bottom line, the, the fundamental part of which is, for want of a better term, snooping. We all accept the work the security services and law enforcement do a difficult job well. I, for one, experienced that um, myself with 7-7. Uh, the two tube bombings in Russell Square in King's Cross are our, were our two local tube stations. The bus um, happened very close to where we live. Uh, one person from my street uh, was killed in that. Uh, my children, who were then uh, pretty small, were frightened to go on public transport um, for many a month. So just let me put this canard, which admittedly our um, adversaries have not um, raised explicitly, that anybody expressing concerns about the actions of law enforcement or the espionage service, anybody expressing concerns about civil liberties, let nobody accuse people of not being... Um, aware of the dangers of being soft on terrorism, because that is certainly not what we are. The question is, what kind of society are we defending? What kind of society do we want to live in? We Brits are fiercely freedom-loving. We don't like or trust the overbearing state. That's why we fought off ID cards that are seen as no problem at all by um, many in continental Europe. Yet on the issues raised by the Snowden revelations, we in Britain seem curiously apathetic, or at least that's how we're depicted. The question of internet privacy, snooping and whistleblowing was central to the German general election that's just happened. And even in the United States, there's been much more of a debate with President Obama promising various changes. Yet here, apart from the odd newspaper article, we are silent. We blithely trust our institutions, but the record suggests that a far more inquisitive and questioning approach would serve us better. And this is why. We live by the rule of law, but ask yourself whether the rule of law has been observed. Do we know, not in the specifics, because obviously the specifics have to remain secret, but even in the general term, what is being done in our name? The Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, in the United States was, how can I put it politely, found out to have been economical with the truth about the prison programme when he appeared before Congress. It was only the detail revealed by Snowden that enabled the inconsistencies to come out. Everyone knew that some snooping on emails, phones, direct messaging was going on, and so it should. Internet companies have long been ready to hand over information under what's called the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaties. That is, I have a concern about person X, I am the person from the security service, I go to the internet company and I say I have a concern about the person. I need that person's communication traffic. And nobody in those companies does or would conceivably refuse that request. This does not happen. Nobody, I suspect nobody even in the top echelons of government on either side of the Atlantic, however, knew the extent of the gigantic dragnet that was going on. And if, as David says, that, yes, we all knew about tempura and prism, and what's the problem? Well, why didn't you come clean? You would not have compromised a single operation if you had said that this was going on. And it is only because of whistleblowing that we found out. What we need, ladies and gentlemen, is an altogether different approach. We need government transparency. The single figure that the Security and Intelligence uh, committee that is supposed to oversee this produces is completely impenetrable. It is going through the motions. In Britain, we are even more secret than in the United States. Companies need the right to be more transparent. Currently, the companies, Google, Yahoo, Facebook, Twitter, all of them, they are suing the US government for the right to be able to reveal information about the requests, not the content of the requests, but the fact of the requests for metadata that they receive under what's called the National Security Letter. For a company official, it is a treasonable offence now even to admit that you have been contacted. At the same time, those companies that aren't interested, such as the telecom companies, 
in revealing the extent of their complicity should be pressurised into doing so. As for our checks and balances that David talked eloquently about, well, I'm sorry to say, David, they are derisory. When challenges are made, these are in the secret courts, and often lawyers have no access to much of the detail. They are flying blind, the public even more so. If judges intervene, again, it is usually shrouded in secrecy. So, we are supposed to rely on our MPs. But I can say, having been involved in this issue for several years now, I can count on the fingers of one hand the number of MPs and peers who have any substantial knowledge about the way the internet works and about the surveillance that surrounds it. It is easy, I say that with great sadness, it is easy for the security agencies to run rings around them, and boy, do they do that. So when William Hague appeared before Parliament, and you may have watched it, um, a, few, uh, a month or two ago with his, and I paraphrase, calm down dears, um, response to the prison uh, allegations, he received variations on the theme of, well done sir, carry on, from credulous parliamentarians. It was dispiriting to watch how little he was held to account, even with the most basic of questions. The process even of parliamentary approval has been seen to be a charade. You may all remember plans to introduce the Communications Data Bill, otherwise known as the Snoopers Charter. Those plans were originally kept secret until the Sunday Times exposed them. And when they were revealed, the Home Office was forced into a consultation. Experts across the board expressed concerns in, in private, uh, and, and these were taken up by Nick Clegg, the Deputy Prime Minister, and everybody was delighted, I certainly was delighted, that the plans were put on hold. Now we know that they didn't need the legislation, they were doing it already. And Philip, when you talk about um, people, uh, the work that you have to do, and people must not stand in the way of uh, impeding your work in real time, well, I am grateful for your honesty, because what you are saying is that balance is dangerous. You've just got to do it, and nobody should stand in your way. There is nothing wrong with targeted surveillance. That is what the companies thought was, was happening. Little did people know it was on a far greater scale, with precious little legal framework governing much of the activity. Now we know that not only do the agencies snoop by tapping into the cables, but they've even ordered companies deliberately to put in malware to, in, to weaken individual security controls. Secret agreements such as these, completely outside the law or outside scrutiny, are terrifying. And yes, we accept the bona fides of uh, David, of Philip, and I've known others in senior positions in the intelligence services, um, extremely good men and women. But should we go entirely on the basis of trust? And after all, and I know this is a tangential point, but let us not forget it was the security services that um, allowed and worked with politicians to construct intelligence on the Iraq war that turned out to be somewhat less than truthful. In conclusion, what sort of society do we want and how do we want to project ourselves to the rest of the world? Do we want a society in which everyone is a potential terrorist? Therefore, keep tabs on as many people as possible, just in case now or sometime in, in the future they might get up to no good. That means all of you here. Any of you at any point in the future will sometime get up to no good, so it's good that we keep tabs on you and that we store your, your metadata just in case. Why enact a targeted law when you can have a vague law? Why restrain your security apparatus when you don't have to? Do we want a society in which we should be fobbed off with a mantra, if you've done nothing wrong, you've got nothing to hide? Britain has a great story to tell in helping promote democracy around the world and set best practice, as does the United States. I myself have been a member of a group at the Foreign Office that looks to promote free expression around the world, particularly in countries coming out of dictatorship. It is good work that the government is trying to do. The trouble is, I've seen for myself over the last few months, that work now has precious little credibility. 
Those same bloggers, activists and others speaking out for human rights complain that what is the point given that their communications were being spied upon to begin with? They may be right, they may be wrong, but the secrecy does not help. And what of the hypocrisy charge? Real or perceived, it doesn't matter. Next time we urge the Chinese to stop data intercepts around the world, they will turn around and laugh. Next time we encourage the Russians not to bug the communications of organisations they deem to be harmful to the state, they will stick up two fingers. I'm coming to the end. Recently, I asked a senior Asian diplomat if he thought the Chinese would have been surprised by any of the stories. Not at all, he replied. They had long assumed the Americans were doing this. Were they angry? I asked him. Angry? Why on earth would we be angry? He replied. We're just envious of them. They do it so well. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I thought we were better than that. We are better than that. But we need to change course before it's too late. Thank you. We're now going to throw the floor open to all of you to put your questions to the panelists. Um, as always, I would beseech you to be snappy in your questions and not to give us long addresses. Um, we'll take the questions three at a time. But just before we start that, I just want to tell you the result of the opening debate, what you all felt before you heard these very eloquent speakers. And it's fascinating because before we started, 37% of you believed that we should all calm down. 30% thought state snooping was not a price worth paying, and 33% are don't know, so you're almost evenly split. And it will be very interesting to see how many minds get changed. So if we could start by people putting their hands up, please. There's a gentleman here in the white shirt. Um, I'm just looking for a gender balance, failing to see a single woman with her hand up. Sorry, is there one? There's a, there's a no? Yes, you, you, you've got your hand up. Oh, that's a man, sorry. <laughs> I mean, don't worry, I do want the men as well. Okay, and then the gentleman here, three men to start with. You first, sir, and then, and then the man in the white. One Could you say who you are? Um, Rob Dobson. Um, one of the things that hasn't been touched on, uh, which I'm concerned about, is that uh, if an Edward Snowden, who I understand was a contractor, can, um, in, can divulge this information, are there other people who are being paid uh, to divulge similar information. Uh, whether there are people who are being paid to divulge it, do you mean? Well, wh why wouldn't a criminal um, in a similar role take money for doing a similar thing? So yes, okay. Given that there are an estimated 850,000 Americans have access to these databases. Um, yes, the gentleman in the white. And um, then this one, the gentleman here. Yeah, uh, Peter Oza. Um, my question is, so clearly the technology has changed a lot in the last uh, 10, 15 years uh, and, and the capabilities of the secret services. Um, and there seems to be a consensus that there needs to be a system of checks and balances. So my question is, how has that system of checks and balances in the UK been adapted in the last 10 to 15 years to, to deal with those uh, changes? Because none of the panelists actually addressed that uh, point. Thank you. And this gentleman here. Thank you very much indeed. I'm, I'm sadly old enough to remember the spy catcher. Sorry, will you just tell me your name? Uh, sorry, my name is Nick Pisani, and um, I was also partly responsible for the way David Cameron looked and him not having a tie. Um, that is an aside. Um, I remember spy catcher and the huge resources the state threw against him and the trial in Australia. And we see the same thing again now with the Americans and Edward, Sturt, um, Edward Snowden. And what I, what I really wonder is this. Um, if the advice that the opponents had given had been taken, which is you were more upfront about what you're actually doing, why does the full weight of the state have to be thrown against these people, which gives the impression that what they're doing is far, far more serious than in fact it really is, which is telling us stuff that you guys should have told us anyway. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, I think everyone just wants to know why are you responsible for David Cameron? Uh, right. uh, question time. Uh, uh, oh, just, can you just give him the mic back? He can't leave that 
I was the editor there. of Question Time, a one-time head of presentation for David Cameron. Thank you. Um, so the really important question, sorry, back to those. Um, what on earth are we doing to oversee this? Has it changed as surveillance has changed? And um, why, uh, if the security services say you all knew it anyway, why are they trying to basically eliminate the people who tell us about it? Um, I think you should be the first person to answer on that one, David. I'm going to tackle that precise question. Um, the full weight of the state is, of course, not being thrown at Mr. Snowden. He's uh, in a form of sanctuary in Moscow. Not if the Americans had anything to do with it. But why would I be concerned? Because Mr. Snowden's associate, Mr. David Miranda, was stopped at Heathrow Airport, and he had 58,000 top-secret intelligence documents stolen from this country. 58,000. And they weren't about prism and tempera. They were about how we support our armed forces in Afghanistan. They were about how we hunt down terrorists. They were, it was everything that British intelligence is doing. And he stole them all. And he stole even more from the Americans. Why? What on earth was he thinking of? And those documents, we must conclude, because of the poor security that they applied, are in the hands of Moscow and Beijing. So the next round of cyber attacks that come from China, they will know exactly how to evade our defenses. That's not whistleblowing. I don't know what it is, but it's not whistleblowing. And that's why people in the state, in the United States and over here, have got more than a little agitated about the antics of Mr. Snowden. He has already done real damage to our security, and that's quite separate from his whistleblowing. I have no problem with having a debate about PRISM and so on, as you've seen this evening, and I'm all for more transparency on that, and I agree entirely with John Kampfner on that. David, you, you talk about his having allowed, because he wasn't maintaining security, those secrets perhaps to go to China and Beijing, but surely the problem lies with the NSA, which allowed somebody like Snowden such access to this. Surely they were the first gatekeepers. Well, absolutely. Um, but, but doesn't that make one absolutely petrified about what they're collecting if it's so easily disseminated and stolen? No, because I think Snowden was a special case. He was given a special mission. He was trusted. I wouldn't have employed him, but they did. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, John, what's your response to that, as well as the question of how is the oh. system of checks and balances, and this raises the whole question of whether criminals can get access to this stuff? Well, uh, absolutely. Um, the original um, WikiLeaks um, disclosures, if you want to keep something um, top secret and confidential, I suggest you don't uh, include two million people on your copy list. Um, that wasn't the case with Snowden. Just no, I'm, talking absolute, I'm talking originally no, about the... I'm just to yeah. be absolutely clear, many of those documents would only have been seen by a handful of people, but what, Snowden what? had but, privileged well, access I... as the techie who ran the system. I'm so talking... always watch out for the guy in the basement. I'm, well... <laughs> Shows how weak the links are, then. Um, there is an absolute inconsistency in the over-classification, which in the case of WikiLeaks took place. In this case, I concede it was different. But the propensity by the nature of the beast, by the nature of secret services, it is to be secret. People who are um, uh, older, my age and, and older in this hall, will remember that you couldn't even say where the British uh, Secret Services offices were. You couldn't even give the name of the person who was uh, in charge of MI6. In America, thankfully, um, they've, they've been a lot more grown up about this um, for a lot longer. So this idea that we cannot uh, talk about stuff um, is, I would argue, if I was um, a spook or uh, a leader of any of these organizations, they're actually doing themselves a disservice by behaving the way they do. If they were up front, and David, they would not have been up front. You would not have, I, 
challenge you, if it had not been for the Snowden revelations, would you have come to this hall and talked so openly about prism and tempura? It's only because it was put in the public domain by a whistleblower, whatever you think of the motivations of that whistleblower, that you have done um, so. So this idea yeah, that like people are open like all the time. King's College, London with the master's class in intelligence, a small advertisement here. Yeah. That's exactly, there are books written about this. But the debate we need to have is the debate about privacy. And that's a genuine debate. It's not about revealing lots of secrets about the sources, the exact sources and methods of the intelligence community. Well, that's true, but let's remember that uh, the way that the disclosures are happening is through the media. Uh, Edward Snowden gave them to Glenn Greenwald, who works for The Guardian, and Barton Gelman, who works at The Washington Post. The Guardian now works with The New York Times for reasons of being able to have access to publish because they might be squashed in Britain. But the condition that Snowden gave was no condition. He said, I realize that I'm not the one to judge what should be in the public domain or not. You are a journalist with a journalist organization and integrity, so you think about these issues more depthfully. So I give it to you so that you can exercise the responsibility of how to disclose. So here's how it works. This is why we have these weird fluctuations of calm and then a big disclosure. Because the Guardian and the Times and the Post looks at the information and the data, they vet it, they then write a story around the, dis the document. They don't take the document at face value. They talk to former officials and current officials. By going to current officials, they tip their hands to the public media and to, to the senior officials to say what they're going to be reporting. The re they then, they enter into a back-channel conversation in which you f we find uh, the, the first response is gonna be, if you disclose this, you know, there'll be thermonuclear war tomorrow morning. And so as a journalist, you know this because you get this all the time. So you say, let's be responsible, let's be reasonable. And often, almost always, they're going to exercise um, deep editorial control to not disclose parts of these documents. So they're doing it in a responsible way that balances the public's need to know, to be informed citizens and decide these things with the security interests that we all share for people in your position. Kenneth, can I just bring you back quickly? Fascinating that as all of that has been, to the couple of the questions. Why do you think that the security services and governments come down like tons of bricks on people like Snowden? And is it worrying that criminals could get access to this stuff? And has the system of checks and balances changed with the nature of the surveillance? Of course it's worrying that, um, that this gets disclosed. It is undoubtedly we are, uh, as David said, we're, well, we're, no, we're, we're, we as citizens uh, are harmed by his disclosures, right? Uh, what he has done has undermined our security. There's no question about that. This is now a question of balance. Uh, are we going to become a better society by knowing the degree and scale of these, of these activities, plus the fact that they're operating outside the rule of law so that we can rein it in? The problem is not that we do it, the problem is that we do it with not, without proper constraints. And so it hasn't kept pace at one minute. David, can I bring... Until you said outside the rule of law, that is not the case in this country. The law is inadequate. We didn't know about it. Philip, can I bring you in? Can you answer three of those points? Could you hear those questions here? Yes, yes, I could. And I want to say, in, in deference to my casual British colleagues, I have disrobed here, so I just want to make sure... I, I, I'm curious about the direction this debate is taking. I think Snowden, I think he should be prosecuted, but I think he's raised a valuable question, and that is whether the government should be allowed to acquire massive quantities of data, and if they can acquire it, what should they do with it? Let me be clear. I don't think it's a bad thing for Brits and Americans to know, in the wake of these revelations, the GCHQ and NSA vacuum up large quantities of telephone and email data. How they do it is a problem, but the fact that they do it, to me, that's not a painful revelation. That's what we've been discussing the past 10 minutes. I don't think that question is relevant. I do think government is over-secretive. The question is, should they do it? And if they do it, how can they use it? 
Can I just Thank you very much. John, yes, one quick response. I, um, Philip, I just want to come back to you. If, to quote you, I hope correctly, the fact of the revelation was not painful that you've been doing it, two questions arise. One, are you, one why are you pursuing the person who revealed it um, so much? And two, if it wasn't painful, why didn't you reveal it yourself? First of all, I took an oath when I joined government, and if you're going to apply the rule of law, it has to be applied across the board. Whether it's Britain, the United States, the law says if you take an oath and the federal law considers this classified information that it's illegal to reveal, I'm not going to go out and reveal it. You can't have it both ways. You can't tell me that your security services violate the law, and that's wrong, and then say, this man violated the law, but that's right. So I wouldn't have done it, first of all, because I didn't think it was my responsibility. But second, it's a violation of the law. Um, as to your, I'm sorry, your second question? No, sorry. I mean, my only other point was, if this was not painful, A, why, I wasn't asking the question of you specifically and, and suggesting why didn't you um, uh, mm. break, you know, commit treason. I was... <laughs> I was Thank you. <laughs> Um, <laughs> no, I wasn't born yesterday, that wasn't what I was suggesting um, with respect. I was saying why didn't the administration, if politically and in terms of the state, these revelations are so not painful, why did the state in its wisdom not seek um, to come clean, in fact may well have got public support for them, and in addition, if they are so not painful, why has the state gone so hard against Snowden for revealing such unpainful revelations? Well, I think I've explained that because Snowden is not only revealed that information, which I have no problem about debating PRISM. Mm -hmm. He stole 58,000 British top secret documents about our operations around the world, including supporting our armed forces who are risking their lives in Afghanistan. And he didn't need to do that. I, w I want to stop you there because I want to take some more questions from the audience who will probably be addressing these same issues. Could I see some more hands, please? Um, yes, I w uh, somebody at the back there, yes. Um, and then the gentleman behind her in the whitish or greenish shirt. And then um, this gentleman here in the front. Please, go ahead. Hi, my name is Suhan Hancock and um, I'm a Turkish national. Uh, you might be aware of the things that, that are going on in Turkey and protests there and how much Erdogan is trying to crack down on anyone who questions him. So therefore, I personally am deeply suspicious of any government uh, collecting lots and lots of information about people's opinions and potentially using them to crack them down. Now, my question is to Philip and David, and thank you so much for talking to us, by the way. It's just, you know, I'm assuming you're good men. I'm assuming it, I don't know. <laughs> but do you yourself, as human beings, as reasonable human beings, do you trust every future leader that comes to your country? Do you believe this, this system can never be abused? Do you truly, in your heart, believe that's not possible? And if you think it is possible, why don't you want there to be proper constraints on the use of it. And I think that's pretty much what John over there has been saying from the beginning. Thank you very much. Excellent question. <laughs> and then the gentleman in the row behind, if you could pass the microphone along. I'm sorry, was your name Sue? Couldn't quite hear that. The speaker who just spoke. Sylvia. Yes. Sylvia. Sylvia, thank you. Sorry, carry on. Suka. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hello there. My name is Russ, Russ Tysest. I think my, my position is this. Computers and technology are pretty well infallible. They will capture data. They will capture the haystack. And personally, I have no problem with that. What I have a problem with is humans, the ability of humans to make decisions, and ultimately in these organizations, the ability of these organizations to, over, to provide oversight on these humans and what I haven't seen, and the argument I've seen which dissuades me from my original position, is effectively we see no evidence of any accountability of human behaviour within these organisations. Thank you very much. 
And then the gentleman here. I'm sorry, I've also been told that there's an... Oh, sorry, this one. There's a microphone upstairs, and the next round we will address your questions. Sorry, carry on. Yes, so good evening. I'm John Taysom. I've been at Harvard working on privacy for the last couple of years. Um, I was uh, curious if you could... Um, uh, bearing in mind that you all seem to agree on the need for change in one form or another, I don't think there seems to be much dispute about that. Um, I wonder if you could interpret for us what weight should we put on the fact that it was the Guardian that broke the story. Um, the Guardian, of course, has an unusual governance structure. It's not a private company. Um, it doesn't have shareholders uh, to account to in the way that public companies do and that many private companies do. It's a trust. Um, and I wonder what role you think governance and governance and oversight and the role oversight plays through the governance may play in a potential solution to the problem that you've been discussing. Thank you very much. Philip, can I go to you first in response to those? Um, all governments can't be trusted. There's not enough oversight. And um, could it have been that a newspaper that wasn't frightened of its shareholders was best able to break the story? You know, you shouldn't... You shouldn't trust me. That's why we have a judiciary, a legislative branch, and you have an executive branch in this country. For the person who talked about proper constraints, let's be clear. There is, for example, a substantial difference in terms of constraints between collecting your phone number and collecting your phone call. That is collecting your conversation with another human being. There are significant constraints against me listening to you on the phone. I can't do it because I want to. I, I have to prove what we call probable cause. I do believe that there has to be greater oversight. I'm not arguing that people like me should appear in front of Congress more often. There were times when I appeared in front of Congress once every two weeks, but I do think our Congress and the Parliament need to be aggressive in applying their oversight. I think oversight, at least in this country, needs to be overhauled. I think a lot of people in our Congress don't fully understand the 21st century and the digital age of intelligence and law enforcement. But to suggest that we weren't accountable to the legisla legislative and executive branches, to me, is not what I saw when I got grilled by the, con by the Congress and when I personally went in front of the court you referred to, the FISA court, I've appeared in front of them. That was not a game. Finally, I'm the guardian. This is irrelevant to the conversation, but you asked. I'm deeply uncomfortable when the organizations responsible for reporting the facts in the news to the people participate in and perpetuate the story. That, to me, is a conflict of interest, and it makes me very uncomfortable. Sorry, I didn't understand that, so I might not be the only one. Just explain that again. What, what made you uncomfortable? I thought, I thought Glenn, Glenn Greenwald went far beyond reporting the story. He participated in the story, in my judgment. Of course he was. He got the documents. Did more than No, that. I think he participated well, in... Well, did, no, did, never did, mind. Your, your, your point was that uh, he disclosed the documents, but you can surely see that he revealed the documents to the media. He didn't do what WikiLeaks did and just put them all online for everyone to get. So in some ways, he did exercise a modicum of control, of responsi responsibility control. John, no, my I sense is he was, well, never mind. Can, can we just move on? John, John, what about this question, which is presumably not just about American oversight? I mean, if you are a Turkish citizen, then you might assume that the Americans were tracking you and that they might well pass um, anything that they found on you to the Turkish government if it asked for it. So this isn't just a question of whether you can trust the American government, but of complicity between them. Well, I can, I can speak um, from experience of that. This June or July, I was in Tunis um, speaking at a conference called Freedom Online, which is actually promoted by the British, the American, the Dutch, the Swedish, all the, all the good governments, um, um, to uh, promote um, internet freedom and freedom of expression around the world. And it was obviously pertinent that it was in Tunisia. And I was um, chairing... Um, a televised event, and one of the uh, protagonists, an activist in Jordan, um, who uh, is, is doing the work that, that she is doing to try to 
uh, call into question the, um, uh, the sort of soft authoritarianism of um, the government there. She just turned around and said, I now understand that everything I have been doing over these years has been a sham because everything I have looked at uh, everything I have done has probably been looked at by the Americans and probably um, passed to their allies, my king. Now, there's no way, it, this, you, you then get into hypotheticals, uh, there's no way she can prove her assertion, there's no way that uh, her, her assertion can be disproven either. What is so tragic, which was my concluding remarks in my opening uh, statement, was the extent to which our practice, our rudimentary oversight, our notional oversight, and our secrecy have driven a coach and horses through our credibility when it comes to governments that don't share our values. David. Uh, just a couple of comments, if I may. First, this uh, debate this evening has had a very US-UK sort of focus. I think we've just had the church. Well, no, no, no. Raised, yes. Hear me out. Just in, for the avoidance of doubt, every major democratic state in Europe is busy acquiring this capability. Not because they are malign, not because they don't value the human rights of their citizens, but because they're all under the same threats from terrorism and criminality, and they're all busy trying to protect themselves. And that's a fact. Second point, very good question from this corner over here about the collecting of political opinions. That is unlawful in the United Kingdom. It's in the Act. And that takes us to why do I trust the people? And the answer is I would never trust any system. I want some oversight. I want some reassurance. I want some checks and balances. The first thing I want re reassurance about is what I would call the moral fibre of the people who are doing this work. And that's the job of the parliamentary uh, committee. Now, that committee was recently given new powers to demand and be given information, not just to ask for it, but the power to get information. And I think that was absolutely right, in part because we are moving into this internet age and we need to you know, exercise more vigilance. The judges, I've seen them at work. They are very thorough, as all British judges are. They are impartial. I do trust them. And if they found wrongdoing, they would say so. So, you know, trust but verify. And I think we've got a system of verification. It's been tightened up. So let them prove it, prove themselves. But don't let's fall victim to paranoia. And don't let's make assertions which can either be proved or disproved. And what about the business about passing on intelligence from Britain to its allies, which could threaten people who are living in societies which haven't got as much even over, limited oversight that we have? If we are talking about terrorists, Genuine but we, terrorists. But we could often just be talking about political activists who well, other governments not find uncomfortable. Passing information, I'm sure of this, about political activists. Partly, in part, this is because the, of the close oversight of this work, They've, the way that um, uh, before information is shared, it is a, a legal opinion would be taken if it was sensitive in that sense. But. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not worried about individuals being put at risk the, unless there is a prima facie case for believing that they are narcotics traffickers or terrorists, in which case law enforcement, through law enforcement channels, will almost certainly tip off the host government that you have somebody living in your uh, domain which, and here is the evidence we believe, and you'd better start an investigation. And that okay. goes on all the time between police services. Da Two quick responses. Kenneth first. Can I just come back on, okay. David's, very, sorry, can, yeah. just on David's very specific point, this idea that we would never dream of giving information about political activists um, to another country. 
David, that is just factually incorrect. Look at Libya. We have cases against former British government ministers who were absolutely brown-nosing with Gaddafi when it was um, convenient to do so, who were handing over stuff to Gaddafi um, about his um, adversaries, who then suddenly became our friends. We do this. We, you know, look at, look at, re at rendition. We do this one minute a government is in favor, next minute is an, an adversary, and the same applies in reverse to those ac being active against that government. Well, yes. just, just remember that Gaddafi was persuaded through the weight of the intelligence case he was shown that he could no longer continue with his WMD programs. Had those, yeah, had those David, programs David, been in existence, the Arab Spring in Libya is, would not have taken place. That is a totally place. different that's point. Britain point. participated, is that right, in the rendition of a Libyan activist who is now one of our friends yeah. because Gaddafi asked for him to be seized. Yeah. I mean, we, Joe, one, one good doesn't make, the, make a wrong I, I, right. I'm not arguing that, but I'm not going to comment on a case yeah, that's so, so, in so front of the courts. So the idea that this never happens is clearly untrue. Um, can well, I hang on. You well, you can't. Just, well, you just said that. No, no. That, the truth of that is going to be determined by the courts. There is an investigation going on. I am not going to prejudice it one way or the other tonight, and I would advise you legally we, not to do the enough. same. I think we've heard enough. Okay. Kenneth? Um, I, I do want to draw attention to a few things that both David and Philip have said. So, David has pointed out that every government, every democratic government is trying to acquire this capability. That's a quote. So I would argue that that you know, suggests that it's extremely important that we get the rules right. Philip has said and agreed that the oversight needs to be overhauled. I thought that was interesting. So even the gentleman who had been in charge of surveillance activities agrees that the oversight needs to be halted. So there seems to be this strange coalition and consensus in favor of rejecting the motion. Now, David... No, I don't think you could jump, no, I don't think you could jump to that conclusion. Okay, now, but David, David's point about judges is important. You know, he says that judges are doing their work as, as well as they could. But of course, the whole point of justice is not that justice be done, but that justice seem to be done. And so many of the objections is because this is hidden under the cloak of law, but when it crops up, when the head crops up, so for example, in American you know, open public hearings with, with legislators, what we do know is that when the director of national intelligence, James Clapper, was asked, are you collecting the records, the telephone records of Americans? He said, no, sir, no, we're not. So I, it seems like there's a lack of integrity considering he lied openly to the American people and to the legislators. I would pose to you by your very standards, do you think that Mr. Clapper should resign? You're putting one interpretation on what he said. He's himself gone on record with a statement clarifying what he said. You can make your own mind up about that. It do, it's irrelevant to the motion. The the can, 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 I just, can I just stop you there for the moment? Because we've got so carried away by the exciting argument. I want to take three questions from the top while the boxes are going to start going round to collect the votes. And then um, as the, our speakers wrap up, they will incorporate answers to the questions that are raised by anybody on the balcony. If there are any hands up, could you put... There's no, gentlemen no. there at the front. Um, is there anyone else on the balcony who'd like to ask a question? Nope, you seem to be the only one. one no? Jenny, this... Jenny, it's right at the back on the right. Right, right at the back, sorry. The, the lights open. mean I can't see you. Where the door's open. Okay, you too. Please go ahead. Yes? And if the other, per other gentleman could make their way over, gentleman or whoever it is, figure could make their way to the, to the mic. Do you remember, if you agree, calm down, dears, put in your four slip. If you think state snooping is a price not worth paying, put in against. Um, hi, my name's Kim Urison. I just have a point for the, uh, the people against this debate. Now, we heard a lot from the second speaker, uh, John, about this idea of freedom. While I agree with it, while I want to be a free Briton, I also have to see that terrorists and criminals and narcotics and human traffickers and child pornographers, all which have been mentioned by the proposition, do want to take that freedom away from me. And on top of that, you mentioned things about there seems to be this assumption which the information collected, the haystack, is used against us. And I really ask, why would 
the MI6 or MI5, use that against me? What possibly could it actually use? You gave this example of Iraq, and I think that is actually a bit out of the way because bring it back to Britain, why would an intelligence agency who is actually controlled by a government which uh, uses... Uh, which is elected, why would it try to spy on me? And Thank if you you're surely much. we should I have trust in that. That's an excellent point, but we haven't got very much time. Um, the other, is there, was there somebody else over in the corner? No, perhaps you were the only questioner up there. There's a guy at the back. I can't, I'm sorry, open. I can't see. Anybody else who'd like to make a point, please make your way to the microphone there. <laughs> nope, it was. Yes? Yeah. Okay. There's a guy standing on the there in the blue shirt. Oh, I'm sorry. There you are. I'm sorry. I couldn't see. Please sorry. ask your question. Uh, Stephen Gore, a, a regular uh, attendant at these events. Um, I think everybody's very concerned about terrorism. You know, the recent uh, events in Kenya have brought home to us just how terrible these things are. But the problem I have, what seems to be happening, is that the definition of terrorism has been expanded. And really what it seems to be all about is that uh, it almost seems to be uh, approaching a dislike of dissent, that, what the, that fear of terrorism is being used to suppress dissent. And I have a feeling that this is what the, uh, what, what the security service is all about. Thank uh, you very much. Well, that was very handy. Two questions that are on each side of the argument, essentially. Um, we're going to go in reverse order the original speeches as each of our speakers in no more than two minutes wraps up their argument. John, you're first. Oh, uh, right, well, I'll just speak really, really quickly. Um, to the gentleman who made the point on the top floor, um, my conviction about hunting down terrorists, people, traffickers, um, child pornographers, um, organized criminals is as strong as yours, and it is as strong as anybody else's in this room. And I preface my marks, uh, remarks at the beginning um, uh, with a specific example. We are not talking about anybody's commitment to fight terrorism or organized criminality. We are talking about, the, about transparency and the accountability of the state to have a far greater sense of confidence that what is being done by good men and women in our name is held to proper scrutiny. And it is a great sadness that it is only through whistleblowers and by the way, the Obama administration has prosecuted more whistleblowers than all previous American administrations put together, um, that we are finding out about some of the activities that are taking place. And if these activities that are taking place are as defensible as Philip and David um, say they are, then all fine and good. So hold yourselves up O oh, secret services, to greater scrutiny, be more robust in defending yourselves. Do, you can hide behind the secrecy of operations, but do not let the necessity of secrecy of operations um, destroy um, a public confidence in what you are doing. And our levels, as we have seen time and time again in recent years, whether we're talking from rendition through any of the other examples we have cited, our levels of knowledge have been far too weak. Our scrutiny and accountability has been far too weak. Thank you. Philip, can we call upon you next, please? I found the conversation more curious than I expected. <laughs> you thought it'd be funny we, jokes. We agree that transparency is good. I think the Snowden revelations on the issue of broad collection are helpful. I think more oversight is fine. I thought the question was as follows. If we had perfect transparency that showed that the government collected massive quantities of data, are you or are you not comfortable with that? And I'd end where I started. In a digital age where conspiracies can be mapped across borders by digital trails, when populations want us not only to enforce the law but to prevent violence, can we not use these digital pools of information for, for, for prevention? And I didn't hear an argument against that. Thank you very much.
Kenneth, what's your response to that challenge? If it was all known, would it all be fine? Well, absolutely not. Uh, the point here is that there is so much of a consensus that we fail to understand where we actually disagree. The consensus is that we all agree that we need accountability and that we need oversight. The question is whether it is enough. Um, what we haven't spoken about tonight is integrity, right? That we know we need surveillance, not the issue. We know that we need the rule of law and the adequate rule of law. We haven't spoken about the fact that we cannot have one without the other. We cannot have a properly functioned and empowered surveillance function by the state unless we, they are constrained. And although I respect Philip and I respect David, I am not willing to give them these powers without bounds. Why it's so important is because of big data. Because more and more of our digital lives are being, uh, excuse me, more and more of our lives are leaving a trace that is digital. So surveillance functions of the state can capture things that they never could understand and could capture before. They can store it forever and make connections like ever before. But the laws that we use to guard against the abuse of these powers date from the 1970s. They were tepid then, and they were still abused nevertheless. So it is utterly essential that if we are going to understand that Moore's law allows us to have an iPhone today that didn't exist four years ago and that tomorrow's iPhone will be as in, the, in, a, in the ring of our finger, it is critical that we put in the proper safeguards and the disclosures by Edward Snowden tell us that it's wanting. I want to stress that I respect the other speakers. For me personally, this is not an easy call. I actually see it, I think it as a 49-51. But at one point, you have to nail your colors to the mast. And I came here tonight to basically say that uh, we absolutely must guard our privacy, because if not, it's too dangerous to leave these powers in control of people who are unaccountable. David, Kenneth is 49.51. How would you tip him in the other direction? I would invite you all just to think about the case being put forward by those who are against the motion. They say that what is going on is, and I'm quoting uh, them now, without limit, balance, or restraint. I hope I've said enough to show that all three of those words are unjustified. There are limits, there are legal limits. There is balance, there is restraint. What I have, I hope, also shown is that it's in the nature of the internet and the global communications that you can only find the needles in the haystack with big, powerful tools. And you've got to buffer up the data to give yourself time to find the needles. It might be better if it was otherwise, but that is the nature of the internet. So actually, on all of us, are agreed that you vote yes, the uh, surveillance is necessary to keep us safe. Where we've got some differences is over how do we keep an eye on this. And I'm all for uh, oversight. Uh, I'm glad that the Parliamentary Oversight Committee has got some new powers. And I'm glad we're having the debate. And I hope we'll have more of the debate. Philip, we've still got a minute or two before the results of the vote come in. Um, I want to ask you whether you think it's a good idea, therefore, that um, America is now thinking of rewriting the law on this. Yes, I do. Uh, as someone suggested, this law is old. I don't think it's just how you oversee the law. I don't think it matches the speed of the Internet today. When I was in government, I found the law inefficient. It was more dedicated to the 1970s when you might want to listen to the electronic emissions, for example, of the Soviet embassy, not to a 21st century where everything's digital. So I think rewriting the law is not only essential, it keeps up with the technological revolution. And do you think any of that would have come about if it hadn't been for the Snowden revelations? That's a good question. I suspect if it, if, it, if it did come about, it would be slower. 
there have been some adjustments in the legislation in recent years, but there were adjustments around the margin. For example, I think questions about oversight of a secret court are critical in an open society. I'm outside government now. Should we, for example, have a civilian oversight board? I think that's a fair question. And you're volunteering to serve on it, I take it? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> David, I, live in the commercial, I live in the commercial world. If it doesn't pay, I'm not there. <laughs> There's a, there's, a, there's a strange irony here because the British government coalition did actually try to bring forward a communications data bill. They didn't necessarily make a very good job of it and it wasn't very easy to understand and the debates in Parliament were frankly pretty uninformed. But that bill is necessary. It was said earlier that you don't need the bill because they're doing it anyway. That's not actually the case. The bill is necessary to give a proper legal foundation so that then the judges can come in and check properly. So I think we actually do need the some new legislation. But, but Speak David, up, John. Sorry, um, the mic wasn't on. But David, the activity was taking place and the bill is now uh, sort of being reinterpreted as giving uh, political oversight to something that was taking place in, in, in the first place, as by your own admission. Well, what was taking place uh, was, if you like, in a legal grey zone. Now, I don't like that. I want clarity. I want legislation. I'm a Democrat. I want Parliament to have come to a conclusion. Are they prepared to allow this, this and this, but not that? So I'm all for having uh, some new legislation because, as Philip has said, the technology is moving so fast. And the trouble is, of course, any legislation you put in now in six months' time is probably going to be outdated. But that's a problem that they'll just have to, have to grapple with. But I come back again and again to just how staggering the global internet is. And w when you think of eight billion devices all communicating with each other, it's, it, it's all inspiring Well, it's absolutely fascinating that I've now got the result. And as you may remember... Um, originally, 30% of you were for the motion that calm down, dears, state snooping is a price worth paying for our security. 30% of you opposed it, and 33% didn't know. Well, you really were swayed one way and another. 60% of you are now for the motion. 37% are against, and only 3% no longer know what they think. Wait a minute, can I change my position? So, so thank you very much, all of you, for being such a lively and engaged audience, and thank you very much to the superb panel and Philip in America. Thank you.